walking on water. And we're going to take a look at a very famous story and the various lessons that Christ is showing us. Right? So we're going to take a look at Peter and Jesus on water, the disciples on water, and what exactly we draw from that story. All right, let's turn to Matthew 14 from the NIV version, 22 to 32. If we can have those scriptures up. So just to give you some context. So Jesus and the disciples, they just finished feeding over about 5,000 people, well over 5,000 people. And at the end of this feast and sermon, Jesus tells the disciples to get on the boat and cross over to the other side while he pretty much sends the people home. That's actually very like humble. That's, you see some humility there. Right? The king, the one who is the master of all, says, you guys go. Go ahead. And I'll clear up. Right? They just finished feeding 5,000 people and preaching to over, over 5,000 people. He says, you guys, get on the boat. Go on to the other side while I dismiss these people. After doing that, he went up to a mountain to pray. While he's praying, the disciples that he made get on the boat encounter some kind of chaos. The winds and the waves are against them. It's a very scary situation. If you've ever been on a, on a boat that the waves are buffeted against before. So they've encountered this problem. <laughs> and in the midst of everything, they see, they see Jesus walking on the water. And they're there, they're trying to find, trying to figure out who it is. It says, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he calls on to Peter. And Peter says, can I come on the water? Jesus says, yes, come. Peter goes on the water. He walks on the water. Then he sinks. They get back on the boat and they cross over. So that's, that's basically the context of it. So let's read and then we'll get into the, into the message. So from verse 22. So that's Matthew 14, 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boats, the wind died down. The reason I like this story is because as a believer, I think you can find yourself in one of the subsections of this scene. You're either on the boat, on the water, or in the water. And we'll learn that most of us are currently either in one of these places or have been in one of these places. And whether you're on the boat, on the water, or in the water, it really doesn't matter. It's okay because you learn something from that. So let's start from the top. Jesus made them get on the boat. They didn't say, oh, we want to get on the boat and go on to the other side and you handle 
the rest of these people and, you know, take care of them or they go home. And no, Jesus made, in fact, the KJV version says he constrained them to get on the boat. So that was his plan, get on the boat. They got on the boat and then they encountered some trouble. Now notice that they were already a considerable distance from land. And where was Jesus? He was on land. He was praying. He was on the mountain. They were far from him. Another version says they were far away from land. So they're in the middle of the water and he's on land. And they've encountered trouble. But he sent them. He made them get on this boat. He's the one that sent them. No matter how far you think God is, he will always be there when you need him. doesn't matter. No matter how far you think he is. No matter how far you think he is. If it looks like he's not there, you're in the middle of a storm, he'll always be there. He'll always be there. But you see, the key thing is that he sent them. He's the one that put them on the boat. He sent them. Do you know one of the most important things for me personally about my journey with Christ and Christianity? It's about hearing God. It's hearing God. Because I believe that if I hear and he says go, there's absolutely nothing that I will encounter that I can't overcome. Nothing. It's important that I hear doesn't matter the situation. Doesn't matter where I'm going. Doesn't matter where I'm. I must, I must hear. So I can always say, he's the one that sent me. I didn't, I didn't do this by myself. He, just, he sent me. So obviously, he's going to carry me through. He's going to carry me along. Hearing is very important. But it's not just one thing to hear. You must also know the voice. If someone you don't know says your name, you'd hear your name, but you don't know who said it. It's the case of Eli in the temple. Right? So back to the story. So he made them get on the boat, and they're going on the boat, and they have trouble. Sometimes we feel like when God says something, that means it's just peace. We're just going to have peace all the way. It's going to be all rosy. You know, there will be no, you know, no contention. There's no, there's no trouble. What is it? Isn't it John 16, 33? That tells us that you will, face, you will face tribulations in the world. You will face tribulations. You will face troubles. This is the truth you need to know. There will be trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. So they're in the middle of the water right now. And then Jesus comes to them in their time of need because he's the one who sent them. So they're his responsibility. He comes to them. And then Peter sees. So now you're on the boat, right? So now let's look at being on the boat. Peter sees him and says, tell me to come. What, like, what did he see? What did Peter see? Because let's think about this, right? You're on a boat, the wind is against you, there are waves, it's, it's chaotic. He sees Jesus, and he says, let me come to you. He didn't say, please change this situation. He said, let me come to you. What did he see? If you think about it, where's the safest place to be? It's on the boat. You have someone to hold on to. You have something to hold on to. It's not on the water. That's, that's what you're afraid of. It's being on the safest place, the comfort zone, is on the boat. It's not the best place you could possibly be right now, but as of right here and the situation, it's on the boat. No one says, I want to get out of the boat because, <laughs> because the winds are against the boat. It's like being on a plane and there's turbulence, and you say, I want to get out of the plane. Let me jump out. The safest place to be is still there. Yet he sees him and he says, I want to come. I want to be with you. What did Peter see? Jesus didn't just come as a man. He 
came in the fullness of God. What Peter saw was the kingdom. Peter saw peace. He saw stillness. Jesus wasn't there like, oh, Peter, come, and the wind is just blowing him left and right. He was still. He saw peace. He said, that situation looks better than where I am right now. Whatever that is, I, I'd rather be there than where I am right now. This place is comfortable, but I would rather be there. If that is the kingdom of God, then count me in. He, because, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you, it doesn't make any sense. Jesus had to be, he had to have come in total peace and stillness. The situation around him couldn't affect the situation of Christ. Jesus wasn't sub subject to the situation. Peter wanted to get on that level as well. So he made a request. What he did was actually pray. Do you know? Do you know that's prayer? He said, let me come. That is prayer. So usually when I see people communicating with Jesus in the Bible, I always link it back to prayer. He's in a place of prayer. He's praying for a miracle. He's praying for a miracle. I mean, he can't do it by himself. He can't do it by himself. So he's praying for a miracle. You see it a lot of times, a lot of the situations and the stories in the Bible. Look in blind, uh, blind, um, blind uh, Bartimaeus, right? This is a blind man. He hears he's, you know, sitting by the roadside. He hears Jesus and his disciples and a crowd passing by. And he starts shouting out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is walking and the crowd is following him. And the crowd starts to rebuke him, the blind man who is shouting out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Let's, let's see how that relates to prayer, right? So you've come into a place of prayer. And have you noticed when you try to pray, that's when all sorts just start going through your mind. All, so, all sorts of distractions. The crowd around Jesus is the distraction. The devil will do anything to keep you from the presence of God. Doesn't matter. He, he doesn't care what he has. He will do it. That's why people think that it's a burden to pray. There's this misconception about what prayer is. You feel like you need to lock yourself and just spend six hours there every single day. So there's this misconception of prayer that keeps people from praying. But this guy keeps on persisting. That's the blind man. Right? He says, son of David, have mercy on me. So the distractions are still there, but he's not letting the distractions affect his request. Son of David, have mercy on him. Then, then what happens? Jesus stops and actually calls him. He has now entered the presence of God. And Jesus asks one of the funniest questions. Say, what do you want me to do for you? This guy is clearly blind. What else could he possibly want? Truth is, he might have wanted money. He might have asked for money. He might have asked for, do you have any spare change? But he says, I want to see. I want my sight. And he was granted his sight. He came into the presence of God and he asked for what he wanted. He prayed. He had to pray through the distractions. He had to pray through the obstacles. And he got there. And he got what he wanted. Persistence in prayer got him there. Same way Peter was on the boats praying for a miracle. Perform a miracle, Lord. I want to walk on water. For you, it might be, I want to lay my hands on this person that has cancer so they can be healed. I want to lay my hands on this. I need to heal this person, Lord. You're on the boat. You're praying. You're making a request. Why was Peter's prayer answered? It was the desire of his heart. He didn't
didn't say he wanted to walk in the boat so he can show the other disciples that he can walk on the boat. It was the desire of his heart. You see, when the Bible tells us that, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts, we tend to get it mixed up. We confuse the desires of our hearts with the desires of our minds. The desires of our minds are influenced by external factors. So let's say the desire of your hearts is to get a good education for your child. Right? So you start praying for that. You're praying for the desires of your hearts and God will grant that to you. Right? So you're praying for a good education. Say, Father, I want to get my child into a good school. So that's your desire. That's an honest, genuine desire. And then you speak to a few people and they say, oh, our kids go to this particular school, this Ivy League school, and you know they're doing great. It's a very good school. You know, yada, yada, yada. Just kind of talking the school up. Then you stop praying about good education and start praying for that school. You've kind of lost your way. The original plan might have been go to this other school. Your, your, your kid will get the best education here, but you've, li you've left good education as a package and just said, I want this school now. You're now praying for the object. You're now praying based on the desires of your mind, what you think you need, what you think you want, instead of the desires of your heart. So Peter is there on the boat, praying. Help me to walk in water, Lord. I want to come to you. I've seen the presence of God. I want to be there because it's much better than where I am right now. Jesus says, yes, come. Do you know those two words? So some version says, yes, come. Some version says, just come. Right? But those two words, or that one word is the most powerful word in this whole story. Because he gives him access to the kingdom. He gives him access. He has made a request to walk in dominion. And he, he has had his prayers answered. He has just been given access. Just a word. Just a word. Some people hear yes, come, and they, they say, oh, wait, let me just, let me get ready. You're still on the boat. You're asking to walk on water, but you're still on the boat because it's comfortable. You get comfortable in your discomforts. He said, yes, come. Access granted. The word of Christ is life. It's truth. That's why reading the Bible is so crucial. It's so, because it, it tells you the truth. It tells you what you can do. It gives you access to walk in dominion. It gives you the keys to the kingdom. That's why you speak the word over the situations that you face. Because you're using that very key. You're speaking what you have read, what you have studied. That is the only attack weapon in the entire armor of God. That is the only attack weapon, the word of God, which is the sword. You have the shield, the helmet, the belt, the sand, you know, the, the sandals, the, you know, so it's, 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 that is the only attack weapon. That is the one you use, but if you don't know how to wield the weapon more than the one you're trying to wield it against, you already lost the battle. So based on that word alone, he gives Peter access to the kingdom of God. He says, yes, come on the water. Because I see that as the desire of your heart. I see that as a genuine prayer. So come. Peter then steps out of the boat. So we understand what being on the boat is, right? Praying, making a request, right? A miraculous request. And then he's coming out of the boat. Now notice that Peter has to come out of the boat himself. Jesus has given him access, but he's 
still has to step out in faith. He has to step out in faith and believe that based on this word, he told me to come, so based on that word, I'm sure I can perform whatever he has asked me to do. And you know, faith, we preach about faith a lot, but it's, I'll confess, it's simpler said than done, to be honest. It's, you know, it's easier said than done. Practicing faith and actually walking in faith is, you would almost seem crazy to the people around you. Can you imagine what the other disciples thought? Um, thought? Say, ah, Peter, you go drown, oh. You go drown. Because remember, the wind and the waves are still around. There's no, I mean, there's no calm yet. There's no, st they're still around. Yet this guy's walking out of the boat. Why? He received the word. The word said he can do it. The word said that he could walk in dominion. He held onto that word and actually came out of the boat. But this is where his faith lies. It is only by faith. It is only by faith. Sometimes we ask to walk, but we can't get out of the boat. Jesus has said, yes, come. He has told you already what you need to do. You're praying, you're praying, you're praying. Can I come? Can I come? Say yes, yes. Yes, can I come? Yes, can I come? Even, he's even tired of telling you yes. He has sent you emails, sent you texts, missed call, everything. You still don't want to see it because you know that you have to apply faith. Without faith, the equation is, it doesn't work. You have to step out in faith. In this case, literally. He steps out of the boat based on the word that Jesus had given to him. And now he's actually performing a miracle. His prayers have actually been answered. Peter is walking on water. He's walking in dominion. Based on the word of God. And faith. There are three things. Faith. The word. And focus. When was the last time you started something you knew only God could finish? Just think about it. Something that you know you didn't have, you didn't really have it down pat, you didn't really have it in control. Like this one, only God can actually help me. That's where he was. So he's out walking on the water, but he has to focus on the one who sent him, on the one who gave him access. He already used the faith to come out by the word that he was given, but he needs to focus. So this is the part where you're walking in dominion. This is the part where you've laid your hands, you're now healing the sick. This is the part where doors are opened in your life. This is the part where everything is really just supernatural. You are walking in the supernatural. But the key thing is keeping your eyes on Christ. The key thing is keeping your eyes on Christ. Because you would see that despite the fact that Peter did walk on water, there was something that happened shortly. So the word tells us that as he walked towards Jesus, he saw the wind. Right? He saw the wind. Wasn't the wind there before? The wind was there before Jesus came. The wind was there when Jesus came. The wind was still there when Peter stepped out of the boat. So what do you mean like what do you mean he saw the wind? He looked. As long as Peter had his eyes set on Christ, he stood above the very thing he was afraid of. What are you 
afraid of? Because just a second ago, they were terrified. It's this same water that brought fear. It's this same water that was a threat. Yes, this guy is walking on it now. He has risen above that very thing that brought fear to him. And while he's upon it, he has to keep his eyes on Christ. As long as his eyes were on Christ, his mind, his heart were on Christ, he was standing above the very thing that he was afraid of. But then he saw what was already there, what had been there all along. So he's focused on Christ, he's walking towards Christ, and it says he saw the wind. So says that when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and then began to sink. Whatever you set your eyes on will consume you. It's really that simple, you know. It's really that simple. Whatever you set your eyes on will consume you. Whether it's fear, whether it's, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's failure, whether it's whatever you're focused on. Because just a moment ago, he was focused on Christ and he was walking in dominion. Now he was focused on the fear, he was focused on the wind. Because, I mean, think about it. You're applying to a new school. You're trying to do your undergrad. The first year, Jesus miraculously pays your school fees. Done. Second year, done. Third year, done. Fourth year, time to pay your fees. And you're like, oh my God, where am I going to get the money from? Where am I going to, where am I going to do this? How am I going to? Can you look back and see who actually brought you here? Because now you're focusing on these other things that he had actually brought you through already. So you already you're already walking on water, and then you are seeing the, and then you're afraid. That's how some. That's how. That's where some of us are. We've walked in dominion. We've been focused on Christ, and as long as you were focused on God, He was elevating you. Doors were open. You've had so many doors open, you just walk into any door, and now you're now busy. You're now too busy to focus on him. You're not focused on, ah, I'm too busy to, I don't know if I can pray. So let me just, I need to, I need to do this, send this email, I need, to, I need to sort all these things out. Forgetting the one who brought you here. So Peter looked, and he began to sink. Because he lost focus of the one who enabled him to actually walk in dominion. He lost focus of the one who gave him the access in the first place. So what is your focus on? What are you looking at, really? When you go out, what, you, what do you look at? In your office, in your personal life, what do you look at? Like, what is your focus? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So if you're focused on money, you will be consumed by money. Simple. That will be your God. That will be your God. As long as you're focused on money. Oh, I'm chasing this money. Or also know so they won't delete you from family group chats. Hustle, or, do you, I mean, do you, so continue hustling. I mean, you know, like if you're focused on that, that will be your God. Or focus on God Himself and let these other things be added onto you. So now you're on the water, right? So we get what being on the water is. You're walking in dominion, you're focused on Christ, and you're in a situation where only Christ can help you. Only God can help you. You've started something that only God can finish. It's scary. 
to be honest, I mean, it's not that easy to do. But you've started something, you know, only, only God can do this. You've applied for a job that you know you do not qualify for. You say, but I, I'm sure I'm, you die. <laughs> it's just out of faith. <laughs> Let me just do something. Right? You started something you know only God can finish. So that's being on the water. You're walking in dominion. Now, being in the water, you are now sinking. You took your eyes off Christ. You've drifted away. Now, this might sound like a bad place to be. It's really, it's really not, really. You know, we'll, 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 we'll talk about it. Right? So you've kind of drifted away. You feel like you've drifted away. And you're sinking now. You took your eyes off Christ. You got lost in your job and whatnot and life itself. And, you know, you're now sinking in your fear, in regrets. The reason I love, you know, this, this part is actually the most, is the part that shows the most love. Because when he begins to sink, he says, save me, Lord. Save me, Lord still recognizes that this is the one who is going to save me. Despite the fact that I took my eyes off you, despite the fact that I lost that relationship that I had, save me. Because I'm drowning in something. I'm drowning in fear. I'm drowning in my own misery. Save me. Do you know this, this part, this, these words, save me, Lord, this is the only part of this story that you can actually use verbatim. Meaning these are the words that you can actually use the same way. Save me, Lord. doesn't matter what is happening in your life. It sounds difficult because it's too easy. If it's an addiction, if it's a habitual sin, save me, Lord. There's, you, can't, you can't drift too far away from Christ. It's not possible no matter where you are. Some people are just sinking. They've built city on, on the water. The aqua man and aqua woman, aqua family. The whole thing on the water. They're just comfortable there. Just because they took their eyes off Christ and they began to sink, they said, ah, it don't be. Built whole underwater city. Just living. <laughs> right? just living in that discomfort because the devil has lied to you that ah, you can't go back because of what you did you can't go back because of what you said and what you've been through ah you disobeyed God how do you know one of the biggest reliefs for me is that God knows the sin you're going to commit before you commit it and he has forgiven you for it so you thinking that can't go back to God. It's just a lie. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you have done, even in this instance. It doesn't really matter. You can always come back. Save me, Lord, from anything. Anything. And you'll see him save you. He'll stretch out his hands to get you. But you have to be willing to actually come back up. So being in the water is actually not a bad place. A lot of people are in the water. And all you have to do is save me, but they don't know. Save me, Lord, and that is it. Now, so Jesus grabs him. They get back on the boat. And he said, so Jesus is asking now. He says, why did you doubt? Oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? What did Peter doubt? Or who did he doubt? Was it himself? Did he doubt Jesus? I don't think so. I mean, uh, partly you can say that, but I think he doubted the word. The word that told him to come in the first place. Jesus said he has come. The word that kept him above the water. The one who kept him above the water doubted when he saw the wind and was afraid consumed by that fear so what are you doubting what word has God given 
you notice when God tells you something is going to happen, he usually doesn't tell you when. He'll just tell you it's going to happen. You have to believe. I mean, it's left to you now. You guys have to work together. When you doubt, you sink. You take your eyes off Christ, you sink. doubted the word of God. He doubted God himself, the ability. Someone who had already walked in dominion. To stay above the water, you must focus on Christ. You must focus on God. It's really that simple. Take your eyes off him and you're consumed by whatever you fix your eyes on. Whatever your focus is on, that is it. It doesn't matter what it is. That is what will have you. That is why constantly, again and again, the Bible tells us, read, meditate on the word, meditate on the word, meditate on the word. Keep my statutes in your heart. Because the word is powerful. Find, a, find any translation to read the Bible in. If, if it's too much for you. My brother was telling me one time, he's like, ah, this Bible is hard. Oh, ye, and thou shalt. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> do you understand? Like, I just too, you know, get NLT version or so. do something, but get that word in you. Because it's that word that keeps you afloat. What are you afraid of? Think about what you're afraid of and what you have your eyes set on. Rise above it by focusing on Christ. These principles are so easy, but it's so hard at the same time. But the paradox exists because we believe it's too easy. Some people don't serve God because they think it's just too easy. They're like, ah, it's not possible. So I don't have to sacrifice anybody. I can just stop the rain. I can just get into this place of dominion without doing anything. You don't believe it. I, I never I never try to convince anyone to believe in Christ. You can't. It's a waste of time. Just show them power. Let them see. Let them see. When they got back on the boat, right? This is one of my best parts. I'm sorry, we're running out of time, but when they got back on the boat, let's let's read just the last verse, right? Thirty two. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. So in the middle of all this, the wind is still there, the waves are still there. But when they got back on the boat, the wind died down. Imagine what the disciples must have been thinking, just watching this whole scenario. And then they get back on the boat. Jesus gets back on the boat, and the wind dies down. Sometimes, rather than praying for God to change the situation you're in, just invite him into the situation. Just invite him in. Because that peace that Peter saw, that kingdom that Peter saw, he brings it with him. So rather than saying, no, God, I hate this job, I hate this company, my boss, the person beside me is smelling, this one, you know, just invite God in. Just invite him in, you'll see. Whatever situation it is, you'll see. Thank you very much.